for me, this is about getting as much practical information out there to all of you. Um, since life is hard, parenting is hard, working with kids is hard, being an adult is hard. So anything that's going to help us have a better understanding of ourselves and of our families and our children, um, that that to me is my purpose in life. So I am an elementary school counselor by day at Jenks East Elementary. Absolutely love working there. I've also been a parent educator for years, over 20 years now. Really enjoy working with parents. I teach some parenting classes for family and children's services. I also teach parenting classes and run parenting and anger management groups for improving lives counseling services as an LPC candidate. Um, and so lots of different um things that I like to do, but basically at the core of it all is I just really like to help families and try to make that as practical as possible. So tonight we're going to, we have lots of different things that I've kind of merged into this presentation, but the overall impact is we're going to be looking at the impact of trauma on the brain and then how that impacts emotional regulation, not just, you know, with a, a focus, especially on children, but also any of this information is applicable to teenagers and to us as adults. Now, once you kind of understand how trauma impacts the brain, what I found for myself personally over the years, I came from when I first entered education back in the early 90s um, as a psych tech and then as a fourth grade classroom teacher, everything was about behavior modification. We're going to fix behavior. We're going to fix behavior. We're going to do this in the environment and fix this and fix that. There wasn't a lot of information about the brain. There wasn't a lot of information in my teacher training about how the brain impacts behavior and how trauma impacts the brain. So that's one thing that I'm so grateful to have learned so much more about over the last decade, especially, um, is how trauma impacts the brain. And that's what's impacting behavior. We can focus on behavior all we want, but we cannot really make headway until we also focus on the brain and understand it. So once we look at the impact of trauma on the brain, then we're going to look at some specific brain-based interventions. You know, some of the Dan Siegel techniques from his whole brain child um, workbook and book, some new patterns, like specific strategies for teaching coping skills, preventing meltdowns, um, building new mindfulness brain patterns in the brain all those different kinds of things that with this understanding of trauma in the brain, you know, here are things that might actually make a difference. But I think another thing that I want to remind us is none of this stuff can happen overnight. Trauma doesn't happen overnight. And rebuilding and rewiring the brain doesn't happen overnight. So while we are in the middle of the journey, when we're in the middle of the remodel and the construction and, and all the mess, we sometimes can lose sight of the fact that we really are making a difference, but it takes time. The brain is a pattern seeking device. And I, I say this in m almost all of my presentations, you know, if the brain's in, you know, it's, it's regular response is freak out mode. You know, something bothers me, I freak out. Something bothers me, I freak out. Then the brain it's going to do, get really good at what it does. It wants to, if it's good at freaking out, then it's going to get super efficient at freaking out. Well, if I want to change that pattern, if I want to build a new highway, a new neural pathway in the brain, it takes time. It takes repetition. It takes practice. It takes mistakes and learning from those mistakes. And I think that's really hard for a lot of us who are in this journey if we've experienced trauma or we are working with children who have been through trauma um, or who are really struggling with emotional dysregulation, it's tough. It's not easy. And we can be overwhelmed by the behavior. So I really want to encourage you. It takes time. Just like as parents, we don't have our kids for one year and then, oh, they're ready. We're They say 18 years. Well, I, I have 27 year old, you know, we're still actively you know, involved in their lives. It takes years and years and years of building and building and building, and we don't always see the payoffs right away. So have that patience. Now, another thing that I think is important for us to know is who are some good heroes, some really great sources of information to go to. So in my particular living experience and in my, some of the different professional developments that I've gone to or people that I was recommended, um, and learned about when I was in grad school for my counseling degree, 
Uh, these are these are three of my top favorites. There's so many more wonderful ones out there, and that's another great thing. If you share those out, put those in the chat section. We can in, I can include some of that information in our extra resources. But Dr. Barbara Sorrells, she's right here in Tulsa. I love her. She does a lot of work with schools. Um, really um, works with a lot of early childhood programs to help understand the impact of trauma on the brain. And so I've done a link to her website's Connected Kids, but on her website, there's even some paid trainings that you can do and some free videos and things that she has that would be a great, if you want to learn and you don't necessarily just want to read a book, um, I've actually gone through several of her professional developments that are right on her website. I've even paid for some of them because she is just such an amazing resource. Dr. Bruce Perry will refer to a lot of his work. I was introduced to his work when I was in graduate school, getting my counseling master's. But he has what's called the neurosequential model of brain development, how the brain, based on how old we are in brain development and where trauma impacts us in that sequence, um, has a big impact on behavior. So um, lots of great resources from him. And then another great um, author and speaker, Dr. Dan Siegel. He's a neuroscientist who has written tons of books, a lot of specific parenting books as well. And he takes this complicated information about the brain and he translates it down into words that regular human beings can understand. He also has a lot of great videos on his website. And if you search him on YouTube or search Dr. Perry on YouTube, there's a lot of great videos too that um, could be great resources for you as you can further your learning. Uh, but those are time and time again, if I need good, good information or good advice, um, those are the resources that I go to. So those are some of my um, developmental heroes. Okay, now here's some other things to understand as we jump into brain development and how trauma impacts the brain. We have different parts to our brain, our nervous system and all that. And sometimes we can get stuck without having um, the awareness of we can actually trick our brain. We can do all sorts of stuff that activate different parts of our nervous system. Now, there's one part of our nervous system that we're very familiar with, even if we don't realize we're very familiar with it, because this is the part that we use all the time. The sympathetic part of our nervous system, that's our stress response. Our brain is constantly searching for the next threat. It wants to keep us safe. And sometimes it will interpret something as a threat that isn't even a threat. But our, but our sympathetic, our reactive part of our nervous system, this is the part that revs you up, gets you ready to fight or flight or freeze or run away. Your heart starts to beat faster. Your breath can, your breathing can be fast and shallow. Your pupils expand. Your gut becomes inactive where it's difficult for your gut to digest food because it's getting all um, the blood in, in the nervous system is focused on fight or flight. Blood rushes to your skeletal muscles and away from your brain, and it makes it hard to kind of think clearly. Hormones rush through your body, making you feel anxious, and it spends your energy. That's the reactive part of our nervous system. And a lot of us, especially if we have been through trauma or have children who have been through trauma, a lot of us just kind of get stuck on this part of our nervous system, or our children get stuck in this part of the nervous system. So it always feels like we're constantly in reactive mode. We have another very important part of our nervous system called the parasympathetic nervous system. This is our calm down response. This is when the parasympathetic nervous system is activated, the heartbeat slows and moves to a more rhythmic pattern. Breathing is full and slow. The pupils actually shrink down. The gut is active, so it helps you digest food. When you're not stressed out, you know, you digest things a little bit better. It increases blood flow to the gut and to the lungs and to the brain. Well, if it's increasing blood flow to those parts, they're working more efficiently. Hormones rush in, the kind of hormones that lift your mood and help you relax. And this is the part of your nervous system that conserves your energy. And here's the thing to know about our sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. There are things like our, our sympathetic nervous system, a lot of that is very automatic, um, very reactive because our brain is always looking for the next threat. The parasympathetic nervous system though, you can trick it into activating. All these things that you hear about, mindfulness and deep breathing and other um, activities like that, it actually, our body can't help itself. It automatically activates that parasympathetic nervous system. 
problem is, is if we don't use that a lot, it just doesn't get a lot of practice. So a lot of the stuff that we'll talk about tonight that are strategies to help kids from trauma, it is over and over and over activating that parasympathetic nervous system. While they might want to go to fight or flight, I want to help them have their heartbeat slow and in a rhythmic way. Well, if I do these specific things, it's going to help that part of their nervous system turn on. So I, what I love is you can use these strategies and literally trick your brain and body into calming down. And it's a beautiful thing. Um, all right. Now, it also is important for you to understand that our brain has different parts and all of them serve a very important purpose. For the brain stem, that's the ancient brain. That's the part of our body that regulates our basic processes, our states of arousal, the flight or flight part of our brain. So that's kind of like our survivor brain. And the number one question it's always asking is, am I safe? If it doesn't feel safe, you're stuck there. All right. The limbic system, this kind of midbrain, that's where our emotions are stored, where we evaluate good and bad, where we form relationships, kind of like those emotional connections and emotional attachments, and that's where our memory is stored. Now, the other thing about that part of the brain, the midbrain, the limbic system, that's where our traumatic memories are stored as well. So there are certain types of therapy that are more effective at helping unleash some of those traumatic memories that are stored. And then our cerebral cortex, this thinking brain is kind of right, right up here, right behind our forehead area. That's where our thinking, our imagination, where we can combine facts and experiences, um, our language system, all of those things are in the cerebral cortex. Now, according to Dr. Perry's neurosequential model of brain development, um, if we have an understanding of the parts of the brain, we have to understand too how trauma then impacts those parts of the brain. So brain development, as we develop, our brain development is based on pattern and repetition and rhythm. So for example, when a child is learning to walk, they over and over and over pull up and pull up and pull up. And so that becomes a smooth process. And now they're ready to take steps and steps and steps. And they repeat that over again. And that becomes a smooth process. When we're teaching them to talk, we're repeating the same words over and over and over again. When kids go through school, you know, they are learning and hearing addition and subtraction and language and all those and shapes and colors over and over and over again. It's not just a one-time thing. That's how our brains develop that pattern and repetition and rhythm. Now, trauma in early childhood, kids are typically in chaotic environments, loud environments, unpredictable environments, environments where their needs aren't met, you know, where they can cry and someone's not coming to soothe them. They might be hungry and they don't get that need met. So it's a chaotic environment. And if they are raised in that kind of traumatic kind of chaos, what that creates is a disorganized brainstem. Now, if you remember back here, the brainstem, that's right here on the back. That's the, everything goes through the brainstem. That's our, kind of like our hub. And so if we from early childhood or from childhood have a chaotic, traumatic environment, then we automatically get a disorganized brainstem because there's not healthy repetition of patterns, or maybe the repetitions of, of patterns are scary, dangerous repetitions of patterns. And everything starts at the brainstem. Here's what we want our children to be able to do. We want them to be up here in this cortical, this prefrontal cortex level where they have empathy. They realize how their behavior impacts others. They have self-control. They can read. You know, they can use those higher level thinking skills. That's where we want and kind of expect our kids to be. Um, however, they can't get up there if this whole bottom part of this pyramid is a total chaotic mess, they can't get there. They need stuff that's going to help them at their brainstem level so that they can get there. So first it goes to the brainstem, then that midbrain, the coordination and movement, the emotional response. Finally, we can get up to this higher level self-control type stuff. Now, what a lot of us without realizing it as we're going about this backwards, we're focusing on the self-control without realizing that if I want self-control, I have to help reorganize the brainstem. If I want managed, controlled emotional responses, I have to help reorganize the brainstem if it's been through chaos. 
very important for you to understand that. And there's tons. I mean, like that is a very, very quick summary of his neurosequential model of brain development. And depending on when a child experiences trauma um, and whatever developmental job they were trying to get done at that stage, it can kind of interrupt that developmental job. So very, you know, his model and even his counseling model is to go back in and address those needs in their um, neurodevelopment um, before we can progress on to what they need right here and right now that they're older. So just remember, everything starts at the brainstem. Now, what is trauma? Trauma is any event that undermines a child's sense of physical or emotional safety that poses a threat either to the kids or to their parents. So maybe they aren't hurt, but maybe an adult in their life is in a traumatic situation. Children, without even having to think about it instinctually, they know they can't take care of themselves. They need the adults around them to be safe so they can be safe. So if they haven't had the opportunity to be around safe adults or emotionally regulated adults, um, that makes it really hard for them to feel safe. Now, the other thing, and I learned this in a Dr. Barbara Sorrell's workshop, is every emotion that we are feeling, that is actually coming from neurochemical cocktail. It's, you know, our brain releases hormones, neurochemicals, all these different things in our brain, and that creates the actual feeling. Those neurochemicals also are the things that activate the sympathetic, the reactive part of our nervous system, or those are also the same, some of those positive emotions, some of those calming feelings, of peace and joy and happiness, those also have a corresponding neurochemical cocktail that activates the parasympathetic part of our nervous system. A child from poverty or trauma, they can actually develop what's called a sensitized trauma response, stress response. Everything is considered a threat if it's new. Even a birthday party. I don't know this. This isn't something I'm familiar with. This isn't part of my everyday life. Even this good, positive, exciting thing can be overwhelming and the brain can interpret that as a threat. So just remember, if I have a child from trauma, there are very specific things I need to be aware of based on how their brain is wired. It doesn't like new. It doesn't like surprises. It likes predictability and things like that. So how do I work that into that? All right. Well, you, the adult, are very important in that process. Children's immature brains, they need our more organized brain. So this is where I'm such a big, I mean, I'm an LPC candidate, you know, working towards full licensure. I cannot recommend therapy enough for grownups too. A lot of us have been through tough stuff. If I don't feel like my brain is organized, if I am still recovering from my own trauma, sometimes that can make it really difficult for me to be that um, organized adult, you know, safe, calm, regulated adult for my kiddos. So I'm a big, huge proponent of, I, I think everybody should be doing some sort of therapy in some way, whether that's just a cool support group or a learning environment or, you know, joining a group with Oklahoma Family Network, something that's just going to help us continue to grow. Children learn to regulate by being regulated and they need a um, Children, young children, especially under the age of three, they need what's called co-regulation. They can't just regulate themselves. We can't send them to timeout and tell them to figure it out. They literally can't do that. They need co-regulation where they need an adult to help them regulate up to the age of three. After the age of three, depending on you know their personality, temperament, how much they've been exposed to, they have a better brain capacity to self-regulate. Um, but they can't, um, they can't just do that on their own. They need us. And so that's kind of hard because who do we want to be around? Do we want to be around the two-year-old throwing a fit? No, but sometimes they need our arms around them to actually give them a boundary for their emotions, just holding them. Sometimes they need that because they need a co-regulated adult. And I love how Dr. Scholes puts it. She's like, it's a, like a Bluetooth connection between my brain and that child's brain. When we can be co-regulating together, what a huge impact that is. Now, there's a couple of really good articles on strategies for co-regulating in young children and silence as a strategy that I would highly recommend you reading. We only have an hour. I mean, I could talk for six hours, uh, but there's some really good strategies for young children. One of them was silence as a strategy. It reminds us that when a child is in that emotional reactive part of their brain, makes them lose access to the prefrontal cortex, to the language center of their brain. 
So sometimes what happens is we, the adult, we're trying to process everything through language. Okay, what are you feeling? Tell me how you're feeling. We're talking, 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 while their brain is less and less able to actually express what they're feeling through words because the brain's kind of offline. Sometimes silence can be huge. Sometimes sitting there, just quietly offering your hand and walking them over to a calm place can be a really powerful thing for them. Um, in order to learn how to regulate, they need repeated exposure to saw, to small manageable challenges. Sometimes our tendency is to want to rescue them and keep them at, in a completely stress-free environment. They need to be able to be able to regulate. They need small frustrations. I have some small groups that I run at school. One of my small groups is I have um, a young man in one of my groups who really struggles with he he's on the spectrum and so he really struggles with competition taking turns and all that so what do we do we play a lot of games in our small groups him having the opportunity with just one other person playing a game to experience losing and manage his emotions great opportunity for him to learn we just did that this week and he was starting to and so i just coach him as we're going oh i can see you're starting to get upset all right let's take our deep breath all right, now let's roll the dice. He's he's learned and had he's he's learning to regulate by having these small manageable challenges. All right. Now, there's another, like I'd mentioned, there's some types of of um therapy that can be really effective with trauma for children and for adults because it actually utilizes a different part of the brain. So cognitive behavioral therapy is all about using my thoughts and changing my thoughts to change my emotions. EMDR, things like um, neurofeedback, things like brain spotting. Um, these are brain-based therapy techniques that actually interact with the midbrain where our trauma and our traumatic memories are stored. So if you've really struggled and feel like you've been in therapy forever, or my kids have been in therapy forever, you know, think about maybe switching to some of these kinds of therapies. EMDR and neuro neurofeedback are really, really powerful tools that might be helpful for you. All right, so that kind of gives you a very brief synopsis of what the brain looks like when it's been through trauma. So what in the world do I do? Oh my gosh, this is overwhelming. Well, very specific things you can do to reorganize that brainstem, add rhythm to daily activities. And we'll give examples of all of this. Create soothing, predictable environments. Build relationships, definitely. I know there's a whole thing, TBRI, press based relationship interventions. I have a link to that at the very end um, to some great resources that you guys can look at. But building those relationships and using some brain-based responses like parenting techniques, we'll kind of talk about some of those. And literally directly teaching mindfulness and emotional regulation, like teaching them about their feelings, teaching them specific calm down strategies. This can help reorganize the brainstem. So adding rhythm and soothing environments. Let's look at what those might be, okay? So rhythm helps organize the brain from conception. And I love Dr. Charles said this. She said, you know, just think about it. A baby is inside its mama's tummy and it's what rhythm is it hearing? The heartbeat, you know, and it's super loud. Now, if they were in, you know, in inside their mama's tummy and mama was going through a lot of trauma or things like that, then they experience all of those things also while they are still in the womb. But rhythm, I mean, we're bathed in rhythm from the minute of conception. So using rhythm to our advantage can be a really helpful tool. So one of the stories she told, Dr. Sorrells told in one of her um, professional development workshops was about a tantrum she experienced. So she goes into schools and offers consultation and stuff like that and works with the super tough kids. And so this kid was just over there just having a fit, just losing it. I think it was five years old, something like that. Um, and it, it was a kindergarten classroom and the teachers, they were done. And understandably so. <laughs> it's really hard to be around a kid like that. Dr. Sorrells didn't know this kid from, from Adam. And she's like, all right, I'm going to use the strategy of rhythm just to help his brain, which is all over the place right now, reorganize. So she just started walking side to side, just got down on her knees on his eye level started rocking side to side and just keeping a simple beat with her hands, just a slow clapping motion. And he's like looking at her, noticing this. And he was drawn to the rhythm and he started copying her after a little bit. 
And then he just calmed down and went about his business in class. She didn't say a word. She used rhythm. So I'm like, ha ha, I'm going to use this strategy. So I'm on what's called the, it was called the CPI. Now it's called the mindset team. So when a kid is melting down at school, basically as a school counselor, who are you going to call? Miss Alvarez. So I, um, I got called and this one kid, oh my goodness, he threw multiple fits multiple times a day. And it's really difficult when you have a child who's really struggling like that. And I just come out of one of her workshops and I'm like, all right, I'm going to use rhythm. Now you could talk to this kid all day long. He's not going to calm down. He liked the power struggle. So I had, he was, he had to kind of need, needed a hug. You know, he needed to be prevented from leaving. So I kind of had him in a therapeutic hold. And then I just started singing, I love you you love me while well, i was picking him up so i had him and i was just rocking him while i was holding him and he went from total rage fest to just calming down the rhythm helped his brain match that calmer rhythm and he was able to calm down within just a few minutes whereas typically it was a 45 minute thing so his teacher started doing things like when he would arrive in the morning, sitting in a rocking chair with him for a little bit. When she'd start to see him get escalated, hey, let's read a story and put him in the rocking chair um, because without realizing it, she was tricking his parasympathetic nervous system to activate. So sometimes that rhythm can be a really helpful thing. Another thing I learned in grad school from one of our um, guest speakers as he talked about, he worked in really traumatic environments. He worked with couples who had experienced infidelity. So high, high, high tension environments, lots of um, emotional impact in his sessions. And his sessions would be two hours long. Don't even, don't even, whew, that's, a, that's a long time. Sometimes two to four hours long because he thought, well, we're going to dig some stuff up and actually have a chance to talk through it. So he taught us that one of the best things he ever uses in his counseling office is he talks soft, low, and slow. My natural rhythm is to talk really fast. Da, 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 I've got a lot of information to say. When I've got a child or my own child or my own family member is a little escalated, I switch gears and I talk soft, low, and slow. And it's a choice because sometimes I want to be talking loud and soft, soft, low, and slow. Not only does it calm me down, but typically it helps calm down the people that I'm talking to. So that is another simple way of building in language uh, rhythm into your speaking as well as your tongue. Now, this is one thing that I've shared with my teachers at school, and it's I love the ones who actually copy me, but they have totally done this. So Music that is um, less than 60 beats per minute tends to be de-escalating. It automatically activates our parasympathetic nervous system without us realizing it. So they, a lot of teachers now at my school, they actually have this music on in the background. When the kids arrive, they have this music on in the background. Um, when they are doing their quiet work, they have this music on in the background. So let me pull up one of my favorites. Let's see. Well, not that part. Hold on. Okay, let me see. Um, this is at 528 hertz, and it's, I'm not sure if you guys can hear that. Let's see what's showing my screen. Oh, yeah, it is. But it's just a very simple, steady undertone. And teachers will have that playing in the background. Um, and they have noticed a significant difference in just the mood in their classroom. When kids come in from recess, they'll have that on waiting, um, and they've noticed a significant difference in the mood. So um, those kinds of things, simple 60 beats per minute. So there'll be some links to that that you guys will get. Consider having songs for transition, too. Think about little kids. What do they learn? The cleanup song. Clean up, clean up, everybody everywhere. Clean up, clean up, everybody do their share. That is rhythm, that is predictability, that is a cue. Songs for transitions can be really powerful. If you notice that there are certain times of the day, aka waking up in the morning, aka bedtime, uh, coming home from school, you know, whatever, or if there's certain times of the day for you that are more difficult, you can build in songs 
for those transitions. So one beautiful example is one of one of my good friends. He used to go to summer camp and he has such fond memories of summer camp. He went to Canica camps. Um, and so they would, when he went to camp there, to wake up the campers, they would play um, Christopher Cross's um, sailing song. So I'm going to pull this one. It's just such a beautiful song. Let's see if you... So it just has this gradual crescendo. Um, not a lot of words. Just super relaxing. And this is what they would blast over the loudspeakers. You know, not too loud. And that would be what woke the campers up. No alarm clock. Nothing like that. Just this beautiful, peaceful, calm song. And to this, you know, that whenever that song would come on the radio, that was like, oh, I love this song. And it would take him back to that time when he felt safe and warm and cozy. What if instead of an alarm clock, you had a song that woke kids up? That could be something. Um, working in transition songs, having specific 60 beats per minute music uh 60 beats per minute music that's on when the kids are getting in the car where are your tough times have some peaceful music that they really like we used songs for cleanup you know i used um fun songs for cleanup disney soundtracks for cleanup with my boys when they were little so those kinds of things can be helpful even having rhythmic rhythmic handshakes um special little knocks that you do any way that you can work in rhythm um into the environment can be really helpful and you might even create a calm down playlist that you just have it ready to go on your phone or have it ready to go on the tablet. Those are great ways to add rhythm and music into your classroom or your home environment. What does that do? It reorganizes the brainstem. I'm creating predictable rhythm and pattern and repetition. That reorganizes the brainstem. And then I can maybe get some of those higher level benefits like self-control, emotional regulation, that kind of stuff. Another important thing is to create soothing environments. Less is more. Try to have your space uncluttered. Don't fill up the walls. Keep it sweet and simple and calm. Now, I'm not saying that you have to turn into a minimalist overnight, but would you agree that a lot of our children's environments are way overstimulating? There's just too much stuff on the walls, too much color, too much pattern. Create simple, calming, soothing environments if you have a kid who really struggles with emotional regulation. Um, that's even things like turning the lights down low. You know, I have tons of teachers who in their classrooms, they don't have the overhead lights on. They have lamps on. They have the lights off and just allow light to come in through the windows. You know what? I love going to those classrooms because they're just, there's just peaceful feeling. It's a soothing environment. Um, so with that, that's how you can organize space with time having predictable schedules or visual schedules that can really help a kid who struggles with trauma because they know what comes next. So give specific tasks for those who struggle with transition. So if it's hard for them to stop doing one thing and start doing another, give them a job to do. Another really great thing that Dr. Shorles recommends doing is when you know a transition is about to happen, ask them, hey, what do you want to finish in the next three minutes before we move on to the next thing? If you've got a kid or a student that struggles with transitions, prepare them. Hey, what do you want to get finished in the next three minutes so you're ready when we have to stop doing this? That gets their mind ready for it. And try to minimize transitions. I mean, too many different things in a day isn't fun. Some of my kids that I deal with that are struggling with stress and anxiety, their schedules are off the wall. I had one kid coming in and he had wrestling, he had football, he had basketball, he had taekwondo he had youth group he had so many different amazing things and he's like i never even get to eat at home i'm always eating in the car he was so stressed out not because of bad things because of too many good things so minimize transitions as much as possible and as well as that soothing environment have that 60 beats per minute music playing on in the background lower the lights use natural light any of those kinds of things um can really help create those soothing environments Consider creating a calm space in your home or if you are a teacher in your classroom or if you're a therapist, right in your therapy office. Um, so I had one student at school where they actually made his closet into 
his calm down space and he had a bunch of squish mallows and pillows in there. He had some of those Christmas lights, you know, just the white Christmas lights. He turned off the lights in there and he'd just go in there and read when he was upset. He created his own calm down corner in his own room. Um, and that's a place you can just go to change your mood. So think about spaces that you could have in your home. Now, again, it's not filling these spaces with all sorts of knickknack paddy wax, smooth, smooth uh, soothing, calming spaces. I've even had teachers just take a shower curtain rod, have a um, uh, filing cabinet, and then the walls right here, and they move the filing cabinet so they can put the shower curtain rod or the curtain rod between the um, filing cabinet and the wall, and they just hang a curtain there. So it's just a little teeny place that they've created a little alcove and they often have like a little soft pillow or something they can sit on and it's just a quiet separate space sometimes that can be really helpful and within that space maybe you have a calm down bucket i love that aaron sent this to me that uh and they're even having a calming water bottle event where you'll get the supplies i'll email mail to you for a water bottle event but what if you had a calm down bucket? And in that, it has all sorts of really cool soothing things. You know, that could be a great thing to have for creating soothing environments. And kids love all the little knickknacks and stuff like that. If you celebrate Easter, you know, consider putting some things like that in an Easter basket. I mean, that could be something that would be helpful. Um, so those are some ideas for adding rhythm and creating soothing environments. So less is definitely more. Now, this other idea of directly teaching coping skills. This is that prevention piece. And in the heat of the moment, these are ways that you can respond. Um, kids don't just, because they get older, automatically learn about their emotions. These are things that are directly taught, just like we teach them to brush their teeth, just like we teach them their math facts. Um, they need to learn how to do things. Um, up to the age of three, they definitely need an adult for co-regulation. But then, especially after the age of three, they can start to develop words to go with feelings if we're teaching them. And they really can connect to stories. Um, there's so many good books out there. And the beautiful thing about all these children's books is even if you don't have your own library, there's so many people that have made little read-alouds um, on YouTube and stuff like that, where they're reading some of these books that you may or may not be able to afford to buy. Use the library is also another powerful tool, but I'm a big fan in collecting some of these books. So now remember, if I'm teaching a new behavior, remember how kids learn. When they learn a new behavior, it's not, I tell you once and it's done. And this goes back to what I was talking about. Give yourself some time to build these new neural pathways. They need modeling, which is us showing them what to do. They need guided practice. They need independent practice and they need lots and lots of repetition. So I've even, there is a thing um, in the responsive classroom curriculum called interactive modeling. And it's a lot of times we will show kids what we don't want them to do. Like, oh, right, what am I doing wrong? Why are we showing them what we don't want them to do? Show them what we do want them to do. So for example, in interactive modeling, if you're modeling a new behavior, you would literally just show them and say, okay, I want you to watch what I'm doing. What did you see me do? And you'd start asking them, well, you, you were crying and, and then you stopped and you were breathing. Okay. What else did you notice? You were doing something with your hand. Yeah. I was drawing a box with my hand. What else did you notice? Okay. So I'm modeling what I want them to do. And then I say, okay, you show me. Who thinks that they could actually do what I just did? And this could be for your one kid or for a whole classroom full of kids. Have them show you and ask the kids, what did you notice? All right, guys, let's all do this together. I'm literally, without saying words, I'm modeling for them what I want them to do, asking them what they noticed, having them show it to me, letting me tell them what I noticed, and then we practice it together. That's modeling, guided practice, independent practice, and repetition. That's a great way of teaching emotional regulation skills as well, that interactive modeling. Um, there's so many good movies out there now, too. Hey, kids love their technology. What if you used it to your advantage? There's tons of really cool movies about feelings. Inside Out is a classic example. I have a friend from college, his son, um, 
is autistic. And for him, the power of story helps him actually identify feelings in a way that makes sense to him. The feeling is very abstract, but when he sees it as a movie character, that made sense to him. So Inside Out was a massive movie for him. And I've got some links to some really great, there's tons of great movies and videos and things like that about emotions. So again, to teach emotional regulation, children need the ability to do these things. These are the things that we need to teach them. I can name my feelings. So I'm gonna show you some tools for naming feelings. Feelings can change. Understanding, having them understand through stories and about changes in feelings, that what we can do to change our feelings. I can start mad, but I don't have to stay angry. I can change it to calm. Um, I have more than one feeling about something at the same time. That's an important skill for them to understand. My feelings can be different from someone else's feelings. I can manage my strong emotions. And the way we can do that is teaching them deep breathing techniques and specific calming strategies. I can manage my frustrations. The way they learn to manage frustrations is by us allowing to, them to experience small, manageable, challenging tasks. It's not smoothing the road for them and making everything super easy. It's giving them small challenges that they can handle handle with us next to them or handle alone. So they're actually developing the skills, not just talking about it, experiencing it. And there are people who can help me manage my emotions, helping them understand who are their safe adults, who are their safe friends, um, who are their safe people that they can go to when they need help for managing emotions. I had a freshman in high school who had been through a lot and he had just been suspended for 45 days uh, for getting in a really big fight at school. And yes, he was provoked and, you know, it took him a few sessions to even acknowledge that he had a part in it. You know, everything was everyone else's fault. But part of our plan that we came up with is, okay, school seems to be the place where you lose your temper. Let's figure out where this is happening, what parts of the school, and then who are the grownups at school that you can go to when you need help. And he identified one of the school resource officers, like it wasn't a campus police person, but kind of like that. Um, and there was a specific assistant principal um, and a specific teacher that they were his go-to people. So he made a plan. He talked to them about his plan. And the most beautiful thing is when he did go back to school, because they touched for a little bit, he didn't have any more explosions because he had a plan. He had his people that he could go to that could help him manage those emotions. Um, so those are important things. So how do I teach them to do things like name their feelings and understand that feelings can change. Tons of great things. So I've included more links than you could ever have time to do, but there's some great activities. Name that feeling is a cute little video that's embedded here. Bibliotherapy. These are like social emotional books that actually teach them about feelings using mood meters. I'll show you some examples of that. Having mirrors in the classroom or at home so they can actually see their facial expressions can be really helpful. I love the little spot series. And I work with elementary students, but the little spot books, um, okay, there, it's finally in focus. They have these three boxes of books and it's all these different feelings. I absolutely love these books. But the cool thing is that they have these little stuffed animals that go with it. So there's a stuffed, a little round spot for anger and one for peace and one for the scribble is mixed emotions. So when I'll be doing groups at school and stuff like that, They'll go grab a spot and sit with it based on how they're feeling um, at that given moment. And like, I, I've always been surprised. I know we have all these kind of uh, stereotypical ways that we think kids behave. You know who really gets into these more than anything? My fourth grade boys are all over the little spots. And you would think they're all cool. Until, oh, no, my fourth grade boys, they are all over this. Um, but the spot books, they directly teach emotions. And I think these are great. They're great for elementary school age kids. Um, you could kind of paraphrase some of the stories for younger children, um, but they're just fantastic. Absolutely love those. If I were to invest in a set of books as a therapist or as a teacher, I would definitely have a set of the little spot books. Um, Sesame Street has some great videos that actually help you name that emotion. Daniel Tiger has lots of great songs that you can learn that help you name feelings. So use tools that are great for kids to help them learn about these things, just like we would help them learn about the ABCs. Um, all right, also social stories. So a social story basically is 
A lot of times we'll use these for children with special needs or um, children on the spectrum, but they're great for young children too, where you can create a social story about anything. Like if they are afraid of using the toilet with an automatic flusher, you can create a social story about here is what happens when I go into the bathroom. Here is what this will do. You know, you literally walk them through steps at a time. There's even some things where you can create your own social stories. There's apps that you can use for that. So I've included some really good links to some social stories about different scenarios. Like here's some for anger, detailed social stories about managing anger. Um, all these are links to different social stories about calming down for a younger child, keeping your cool. These are great ways for naming emotions and also realizing that key um, strategy of my feelings can change. I also love Julia Cook books. So Julia Cook, man, I wish I, I was smart like her. She's written all these awesome books and we have like a whole library of them um, at my school. And my principal um, used to have half my library in her office for when she'd be talking to students. But, you know, Wilma Jean and the Worry Machine, How to Tame My Anxiety Monster. Um, Decibella, you know, and her, you know, six inch voice, you know, like teaching someone who talks really loudly to talk in a calmer voice. This one is my favorite. I just don't like the sound of no. And there's another one, but it's not my fault. So there's all these great books that she's written that deal with different social, emotional, or behavioral kinds of things, but it's in the context of a story. Stories are really, really powerful. And stories are directly teaching emotional regulation. It's giving them the words and the strategies that they need. That's another thing I like about the Julia Cook books is at the end of them, there's very specific strategies for anger, very specific strategies for anxiety, very specific strategies for self-control. Um, and so I, those are some great resources. All of those, of course, will be emailed to you. Now, another way that you can teach kids to name their feelings is to use things called mood meters in the zones of regulation, where they don't even have to use their words. They can literally point. Um, and so these are great ways to check in with kids. If you run a classroom, great way to check in with kids when they walk in. I have some teachers that actually have like little clothespins that their kid will put their clothespin with their name on it in whatever zone they're in. Um, these can be great things to have in a calm corner in your house or in a classroom. Um, and use phrases like, when I know how you feel, I can be better at helping you, you know, have them point to how they're feeling. Feelings are okay. There isn't a bad feeling. What we do with that feeling is important. Uh, you know, this idea of feelings can change asking them things like, hey, what can you do for yourself to move from angry to calm? You know, that can be, I'm coaching them. What strategy do you want to use to move out of the red zone? And let's get you in the green zone. And I've got a link to my Google files that I have a whole bunch of stuff saved in my Google Drive that you can access to. That can be great nonverbal ways for kids to directly teach coping skills and naming feelings and those kinds of things. You know, also kids aren't fully aware. They're just feel the feelings, but they don't really have the awareness of where they're feeling it in their body. So teach kids to tune into their bodies. How does your body feel when you are getting worried? Where do you feel it? You know, they might feel it in their chest. They might feel nervous. They might feel my, my eyelid starts to twitch when I'm getting uh, um, emotionally escalated. So teach them to cue. How are you feeling? What are you doing? What do you notice you do when you get this, you know, whatever feeling you're dealing with? What are they feeling? What are some of the emotions that they might be feeling? What are they thinking? If we can teach kids to tune into their bodies, then they can catch themselves before they ever get to this completely dysregulated state. And another thing, too, is to really be aware of how transitions for kids from trauma can be really difficult on them. Um, and so transitions often can activate that sympathetic, that reactive part of the nervous system. Um, so I kind of had gone over a few of these things, you know, questions like, what do you want to do in the next three minutes before you move on? Um, but another thing that you can do is build in those calming strategies to transitions have 60 beats per minute music going on, have transition songs. But the big, the big thing is watch for patterns. Instead of constantly feeling like you're in whack-a-mole mode, look for patterns throughout the day. And if you notice that mornings are especially difficult or evenings are especially difficult, 
Instead of focusing on all the fires all at once, focus on one of those things. All right, if my morning routine is where we tend to be the most reactive, what can I do to build rhythm into that environment, to that routine? What can I do to build in a soothing environment to that routine? Maybe that's a calming wake up song. You know, maybe that's allowing an extra 15 minutes for some of those things. Maybe that's setting stuff out the night before when we are not tired and grumpy so that we already have our clothing decisions made for the day. But look at where those patterns are and plan for those transitions. Another one that I really like to use with kids a lot is this thing called a progressive muscle relaxation. And this is where you are actually gradually um, working through all the muscle groups in your body. So you guys have been listening to me for quite some time. We're going to do a quick progressive muscle relaxation so you can kind of see what that feels like. Kind of get your brain calmed as it's trying to soak in all of this information. So I just want you to kind of close your eyes and just sit and relax in your chair. And I want you to take a nice deep breath. If you can breathe in through your nose, great. Not sure if you can do that with allergies, but just take a nice deep breath. And now I want you to squeeze your foot and relax your feet. Now I want you to squeeze your legs and relax your legs. Now I want you to squeeze your tummy and relax your tummy. Now I want you to squeeze your arms and relax your arms. Now I want you to squeeze your face and relax your face. Now I want you to squeeze your whole body and relax your whole body. Now, we did that kind of a rushed version of a progressive muscle relaxation. Here's the weird thing that you just did. When you, through your brain, telling your muscles to squeeze and then telling your muscles to relax, the same neurochemical cocktail that um, your body sends to your muscles to squeeze, to contract, and that other neurochemical cocktail that your body sends to those muscles to relax, those relaxing neurochemical you know, cocktail that you just sent out into your body also relaxes our emotions too. So if I've got a kid who's really struggling to calm their body down for bed, progressive muscle relaxation can be great. If I have a time of day where everyone's all amped up, progressive muscle relaxation could be great. Um, and very simple and very effective to use. So those are just some examples. Um, there's a whole bunch more book ideas that are kind of embedded in the PowerPoint. And I think that those can be really helpful. Now, because I'm getting close to time, I'm going to quickly go through some of these things. But again, you'll get the whole presentation. You never have enough time, Erin. I can't help myself. All right. Now, if we want to also have some brain-based parenting responses, this is the guy that I highly recommend. Dan Siegel wrote a book called The Whole Brain Child. And there is a podcast um, and uh, there should be a YouTube recording of me teaching a whole class on The Whole Brain Child. Um, but in it, he talks about brain-based parenting responses. You know, sometimes we are trying to deal with logic when our kids aren't in the logical side of the brain. Um, there are, the left brain is the logical part of the brain. It's linear, uses words. The right side of the brain, that is the emotional, creative part of the brain. Typically, when we're correcting behavior, when a child is dysregulated, we're using logic. Don't worry, there's nothing to be afraid of. It's not a big deal that it broke. There's no reason to cry. Losing's part of the game. All of these things are true, but that doesn't help our kid. So one thing that Dr. Siegel recommends is this number one strategy is connect, then redirect. Meaning if they are in their emotional, reactive part of their brain, I'm going to meet them there and I'm going to connect to those feelings. I'm going to get on their eye level. I'm going to have soft facial expressions. I'm going to watch my tone of voice. I'm going to have positive touch. Maybe I'm going to give them a hug. Maybe I'm just going to be rubbing them on the back or just having my hand on their head. Something that could be a calming touch to them. Showing empathy, saying, oh, you seem really frustrated right now. You seem really scared right now. Connecting to those feelings. Once I've done that, then I can bring them over and I can redirect the behavior. 
After the child is more emotionally settled, then we can work on solving the problem, come up with solutions, come up with our boundaries, even have our consequences. But if I am constantly trying to fix everything just with the left side of the brain, just with logic, I'm not teaching my kid to integrate both sides. It's okay to have the feelings. I'm going to meet them where they're at and I'm going to bring them over to the calmer prefrontal cortex thinking side of their brain. And what that does is I create an integrated brain. My actual parenting style helps my child integrate the brain. Now, again, there's like a whole hour workshop just on that, but some of those brain-based parenting strategies can be really helpful for kids from trauma too, because he has 10 specific brain-based parenting strategies. So that particular book, that Dan Siegel, the whole brain child book, absolutely love that and there's a workbook too if i were to buy if i could only buy one i'd buy the workbook because it has a summary of each chapter and then very specific exercises for you to figure out what does that look like for me in my house but that really aligns with dr bruce perry's ideas on the neurosequential model of brain development and how that is impacted by trauma all right now one last little thing to squeeze in in two minutes, all right? If we remember, everything starts with the brainstem. And to rewire the brain, we need, um, we have to rewire the brain to get the emotional regulation and the behavior that we want. It takes time and repetition. So these ideas about mindfulness are very important. Mindfulness is literally activating the parasympathetic nervous system over and over and over again so that my child's brain now can calm down more quickly. There are so many great, great, great things that are embedded in here, but you can't just do it once. You have to do it over and over and over again, but it doesn't even have to be obvious. This family mindfulness schedule, right when your kids wake up, a grounding exercise you can do is look at their five senses. Oh, good morning. What's something you can see, something you can smell, something you can hear, something you can touch, something you can taste? If you did that when they wake up or while we're eating breakfast, I am grounding them to the right here and right now. I'm teaching their brain to go to that calm down place. Mindful check-ins. Um, ask your kids, what's something they're feeling physically? What's something they're thinking about? What's something they're feeling emotionally? Mindful eating. How many bites, how many chews can we have while we're eating this up? Let's try 20 different chews before we swallow. That's mindfulness because I'm focusing right here, right now, what my mouth is doing. Um, so there's all sorts of little things that you can build into your daily family routine that with that daily repetition, we are really good about trying to get our kids to brush their teeth. What if we did some of these things every day, over and over, over and over and over? And what are we doing? We're rewiring that brainstem with pattern, repetition, and rhythm. But that's what mindfulness is. Mindfulness isn't this, you know, hokey, weird, kumbaya kind of stuff. Mindfulness is re- wiring the brain. Now, Sesame Street has these awesome monster meditations where they actually collaborated with the Headspace app and created these little quick short videos that are an actual mindfulness thing that could you could work some of those things into your daily routine. Um, and there's all sorts of other apps and things like that that will be listed um, for things. You know, even having things like letting go rituals. You know, I have one of those little um, hand paper shredders. Yep, I have it here. You know, if your kid has had um, a rough day or a rough morning, sometimes just having them write down the thing that's bothering them, they put it in the shredder and they just turn the wheel and they watch it shred right before their eyes. This is another tool that I have in my school counselor office. And especially kids who are having a rough day or really holding on to a grudge, that's a great tool that I use. These are all things that we can do that when our child has a tendency based on how their brain is wired to kind of always be in reactive mode, we can teach them different things. So quick summary, build in 
rhythm and soothing environments. Very important. 60 beats per minute music, having plans for a transition, talking soft, low, and slow. Directly teach coping skills, breathing techniques um, about their feelings, because if they know what to do, if they have those skills, then they have the tools they need to manage the big feelings. And then, you know, having some of your brain-based, your parenting strategies, your parenting responses, if they're brain-based, it's really helpful. So I would highly recommend reading the Dan Siegel book or watching the video on the Oklahoma Family Network. Um, I think it's their YouTube page um, that has stuff like that. And then you building mindfulness into your daily routines. That rewires that brain. So I don't have to be stuck in, oh my gosh, my child's experienced trauma, you know, it's it's doomed. It's not doomed, but you have to be strategic. You have to be specific and you have to know why you're doing what you're doing. It's not just a bunch of hokey little things that we're all putting together. There's reasons why we do these things. Now I have tons and tons, you know, I had a whole bonus section of all sorts of different calm down ideas that um, I wanted you to be able to access when you... Um, get the 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 email that's going to have the the presentation embedded in there. Plus, all the links will be there. If you have any things that you would recommend, um, when you when you get that email from Erin, please respond because I always like to add stuff, and those are things that we can share out with other people. If you have other resources that you would like to add, so that's uh, I tried to squeeze as much as I could in. Um, but that is our time for tonight. I went a little bit over. Erin, is there anything that you want to add before we go? Well, thank you. And I, you can always tell that you're so engaging because everybody stays on to the bitter end. So Lauren, we appreciate your time so much. Um, can't thank you enough after a busy day. I told you guys that she is so full of knowledge and so many ideas. I learned something new every single time I listen to a presentation and I will get this out tomorrow to you with the presentation. Um, again, a quick evaluation that just literally takes one, one or two minutes, but you guys will be so, so glad to get all of this. I know with all of these links and information, um, again, we, you can join us next month um, in April, we do have Why Am I the Way I Am? And um, that'll be a great presentation by Lauren. And again, in May, I'll send you the direct links to um, to register for those, or you can go to oklahomafamilynetwork.org and you can always see all of our upcoming events as well. Our podcast, our YouTube channel, we have a great Facebook page. I'll send you a link for that has all of our upcoming events as well. So thank you so much. Please, you'll have my email, um, Aaron-Parks at OklahomaFamilyNetwork.org if you have any questions. We hope you can join us at our other upcoming events. And thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Lauren, so much. You did a great job. Oh, thank you so much. And always thank you for inviting me. Um, I get to be a nerd for an hour and it's awesome. It's uh, I have my teacher <laughs> high right now. <laughs> You do a great job. Very, very good. Everybody, if you, as you can see in the chat, everybody's so appreciative of your time. So thank you so much. And we look forward to connecting with you again on future events. Everybody have a great evening. Thank you. Bye-bye.